I have a few questions. Can livestock be good for the land? Can the land be good for the livestock? If so, can they also be good for the farmer's pocketbook? Hi, I'm Buzz Clute and I'm a scientist. I don't have enough time in my career to answer all these questions, but I do have a few stories to tell you. This story where I worked alongside Jason Carter and Kenny Mullis, however, is closest to my heart. This is about real farmers, real challenges and real results as we work to bring livestock back to cropland in South Carolina. I'm Jason Carter. I'm a row crop farmer in Eastover, South Carolina. I grow corn, wheat, soybeans, and cotton. And I guess it could go back 10 years to when we first started, or when I first started growing cover crops. After hearing about the, the benefits of having cows growing across the, the ground, the inoculation of microbes from the, from the manure, and the benefits of building the soils back up, I was like, we, Buzz and I always talk about, dang, it's a shame we're growing all this cover crop out here and we don't have any cows. And then Buzz and I went to uh, South Africa in 2019, and we got to actually see, I guess, what multi-paddock grazing moving, where they were actually moving several times a day, I believe. And, um, and on that 16 hour plane flight back, of course, you have a bunch of ideas when you have 16 hours to talk, but um, we came up, we, you know, we got to do this. We got to figure out a way to do it. And I said, well, Buzz, we've got this little 20 acre field. Yes, we had the field, we had the enthusiasm, and we, or should I say Jason, had a plan for the infrastructure. But where would we get the cattle? We ruled out starting a mama cow herd. That was just too much work for a full-time farmer assisted by a full-time researcher. That's where Kenny Mullis came in. I'm in, in Blythewood, which is northern Richland County. I've got a cow-calf operation to finish, so I take them all the way from raising calves to finishing them out and selling you know, grass-fed beef to individuals. So I, I, I graze the mamas and babies on perennial pastures, and then I finish the steers on annual grasses. I plant twice a year, plant the uh, summer annuals and then plant the winter annuals and try to graze all year round. I've known Jason for a long time, and he's a row crop farmer in the same county I'm in, and we just we already had a rapport there, and I uh, started talking, and, and I thought it was a good deal, so we, we kind of proceeded from there. The idea of grazing Kenny's steers for a short time on a contract basis made a lot more sense to us. To prepare the pasture for the animals, Jason had to throw himself into the project, and in spring 2022, he got to work. Perimeter fence and flexible water sources were a priority, and so began our adventure. The history of this field, it was, I guess going back 25 or 30 years, it was just unmanaged Bermuda grass and typical weeds growing out here with horses on it. And there was some cross fencing. So we came in here, took down all the cross fencing, salvaged the better wire. This, this fence was already up when we had enough to go back around and get a good perimeter fence and we put a hot wire all the way around it. So going through the center of the field, we have a two strand electric wire that divides the pasture in half. And along that line, we have three watering points where we can tie in our hose that we move um, daily or every two days for the uh, different zones that we're grazing. Um, they're roughly about 400 feet apart and we have about 150 feet of hose and um, we can move to the east side or the west side of the fence so we can uh, water all the points that we need to for the different zones. Our first year grazing, of course, you know, I was thinking, well, the cows are gonna be standing on the hose. Let's get the heaviest hose we can find. And it was about a, a one inch, um, 150 foot, the, you know, the thickest hose you could find. And, and that's great and it'll probably last forever, but the problems when, when it was full of water and trying to pull it around, it was, you almost needed the, uh, the, the side by side to pull it, it was so heavy. Um, and at, at the time we were using one waterer, we just had a 55 gallon drum cut in half. So roughly about 20 to 22 gallons. Um, the second year we figured out it, this, this hose is just too heavy to be fighting and pulling around. So we went with a lot lighter hose. Um, 
And then we also went with, um, instead of having to move that same water to, to each zone, we went with three different waters. And in March 2022, Kenny brought 16 steers and heifers to the pasture. Our intention was to mimic what we saw in South Africa. We wanted to move the animals as often as practicable. But if I had my way, I'd live on the pasture and move them every two hours. The reality was that Jason was the guy who had to put in the time. Jason's a quick study, as you'll see, and it wasn't long before he was modifying the system to benefit both him and the livestock. Yeah, so we had the step-in um, post and the, um, the reels, and I think the reels have probably about 500 feet on them, on the reels. And uh, we're putting a, uh, a step-in post probably every 11 steps and just you know a single strand and that seems to be working good so the, so the first year we were grazing pretty tight trying to move one to two times a day maybe one acre at a time um, we were probably grazing down you know over 50 percent but but also moving them you know one to two times a day now we got it down to you know every two days that way i can just see what's going on with the cows um, but the time it's we've gotten it down to where I'm not down here much, 20 minutes or so. Yeah. Well, not you know every other day now. Right, right. Now the, you do have the point where you're going to have to take minerals and, and put them into the, the feeder, and that's they're using about 50 pounds a week, so that's once a week. Now we can almost set up a whole entire east or west side, depending on the size of each paddock that we're grazing, and that's that's worked out and saved a lot of time. In 2022, we took the first 16 animals off the pasture in May planted a warm season annual mix, and then brought 35 head back to the pasture one hot day in July. We had a huge warm season forage crop, and we anticipated a very successful summer grazing season. But that grazing event, which lasted until October 2022, had its own challenges. The cows, they, they, they want shade. Anything over 80, they really, in my opinion, you know, to keep them happy, they need shade. So we only have good shade at one end of the pasture. Um, we have a little avenue at the other end that we, we've started using and where they can get some shade. But, um, but what happens is the cows have to start walking longer distances to get to that shade. So we just you know, make sure they have good water and, and good shade. But um, that just means more, more travel for the cows. So the warm season cover crop, I mean, we probably should have started grazing it a little bit earlier, but we had the, uh, the sun hemp in it and the sun hemp, it just took off. We got the a good amount of moisture and it was it was probably pushing 12 feet in some areas so when we went to kind of to graze those areas you you can't even walk through it so we had to come in with a um, four foot bush hog and, and cut our lanes and it was even difficult to cut the lane so we had to um, you know, stand up on the seat and had to get buzzed one time to actually stand up at the other end of the field holding a flag up in the back of the truck just to see where to go because it was it was like a jungle but the, but the cows love it. They they dive right into it, and you know by the next day it's all grazed down to, to nothing. So during the, the summer grazing, um, you know the concern is always if if the well quits working, and um, especially during the summer months when it's hot, you know the cows just they just need so much water. We had the well go out one time, and it's the one day I didn't go to check the water. Of course, that was the day they were out, and um, it's just. And everybody has cow's nose in the summertime. Just you, you got to check it every day. Luckily, I had the nurse tank right by. So we we went with a larger water trough um, during the summer months that held probably 100 gallons, and that would you know buy some time if if the well did quit working or there was a problem. At least they would have water until we got back. One thing that we we do now we do have game cameras on the waters now, so I don't have to worry so much. In the cool season followed by warm season grazing events of 2022, we had no idea of what to expect from weight gains. But you'll see that we learned and were both surprised and encouraged by our results in 2023 and 2024. I think this is the fourth season. Uh, three of those we grazed the cool season annuals and one was a summer annual. Uh, we had a lot better results with the, the cooler season forages because they, they're typically better quality. Uh, the, the summer annuals are just don't don't have the, the nutrient value that, that the uh, winter annuals do. Uh, 
and of course the, the animals do better on the cooler season grasses and get, seem to gain better. The, the weight gains this year, were they were surprising last year, at, I think at 3.2. Uh, we were extremely happy with that, but then when we saw 4.1 this year, we just, you know, first thing, you don't think it's right. Someone's didn't, so after checking the numbers several times, the three of us, um, and we confirmed that they, they were correct, and uh, we're extremely happy with that. Had no idea what we'd see gains like that on, on grazing the pasture. These aren't cows that just came off the sale yard, or you don't know anything about them, and they're crazy as hell. So when you have good cows, they want to come in and eat, they're not wild, that makes a huge difference. So now we're looking at, wow, you know, we can really push these weights and, and make money off the custom grazing versus, you know, just looking at only the benefit of having the cattle back on the ground. I think there's a little bit of money to be made. Like last year, the corn crop wasn't all that great, but we helped added the money back that we made off the custom grazing. That, that made a big difference on the, the income on the pasture. While Jason has always used diverse cover crop mixes, he's made a few crucial adjustments that directly affected the weight gains in 2023 and 2024. We've uh, eliminated the uh, cereal rye out of the mix. Now, cereal rye is still good and you, you get a lot more early growth on it, but we found that the oats have been one of the greatest. I think that's what contributed a lot to our gains last year. There is ryegrass in this mix, and I don't know why. Um, it just didn't seem to do as well. The oats just took off. I don't know if it shaded them out, or maybe we were a little bit too deep. Nelson, and then the, these are black oats, and we've had good luck with the black oats. And then we had clover and vetch. The brassicas, we thought they were gonna be too thick for the, the poundage that we put out there. But actually, they they did okay, but they, there should have been a lot more out there for, for the pounds we put. They, they got hit by the cold, and um, Seems like the, maybe the forage collards hold up a little bit better to the, um, the cold weather. And I would say if, if there's a brassica you're gonna put in the mix, just, just put the forage collards. So this year we've gone with the, you know, like I said, the larger paddocks and moving every two days now. And we might be able to go, now that we're getting more growth, make go every three days. Cause what we're seeing is, instead of the cows going to one area and eating it down to the ground, they're just going and biting the tops of the taller stuff and we're seeing a lot better recovery. So that seems to be working out pretty good because they're not overgrazing and grazing down too low. We're get, you know, still leaving at least 50% of the, the growth out there. In a lot of cases, I think we might've just been grazing 40 and leaving 60. And, and it, it can be a balancing that because of course, cooler it is and earlier in the season, not getting as much growth, but starting about right now, get into April, mid-April, you're gonna really see this grass start to take off. But you don't want it to go too long where then it goes to head. So you're wanting to try to stay ahead of it to keep it grazed down, so keep it in that vegetative stage instead of going to seed. So that's a, something else you have to keep an eye on. Our main objective of the project was to see whether livestock could benefit cropland. Our first corn harvest, 100 bushels per acre in 2023, was a disappointment. But we like to think that we have learned a few good lessons. Last year we planted the corn crop, didn't do quite as well. Um, I think one of the problems might have been we were planting at the end of April. A lot of people would say we were a little bit too late. I think planting late like that might have hurt our yields a little bit. We did put 50 units of nitrogen out. Might have been a little short on the nitrogen. The corn didn't quite have the best color on it. Um, it was planted no-till, no subsoiling. There might have been some areas where there was some compaction, but we can go out here when the, the ground is completely saturated and go out with a probe and Really, this pasture, after having cows on it for three years, is really no more compacted than any of my row crop land. But this year, when we plant cotton, we are, are going to subsoil them. Paying my friend Jamie Land will plant the cotton, and his planter strip-till rig is rigged up with a um, subsoiler on it. And I think we'll probably see some benefits from that. This year with the cotton, it worked out perfect. I mean, it's perfect timing. The cotton looks good. Um, and we just had an inch of rain yesterday and got a little nitrogen on it a couple of days ago. Uh, looks excellent. It's um, got a good stand, so I think it's a uh, potential to be a good crop if we can just keep getting some rains. Um, the only thing with the cotton and any later planted crops is that just delays you getting your cover crop planted, but I think we have enough time. 
since we hadn't applied any commercial fertilizer or lime to this field from the end of 2019 through April 2023, we wanted to make sure soil fertility didn't suffer. We also anticipated that soil organic matter would increase over time in this Norfolk loamy sand soil. Yeah, so we've seen about a half a percent gain on organic matter since um, fall of 2020, and um, which has been very surprising. A lot more better gains, you know, having the cows on the land than what I'm seeing just on my regular row crop land with just a cover crop. Um, I think having the cows is definitely helping, but we're also planting the pasture a lot heavier, uh, a lot more seed per acre where the cover crop on a regular row crop land, we're only putting 20 to 25 pounds of seed to the acre where on this cattle grazing, we've put as low as 80, but as much as a, probably 105 or 10 pounds to the acre. So we got a lot more seed per acre. So there's a lot more roots, plus the cattle grazing and stimulating it and, um, I just think we're, we're just getting a lot better gains because we're growing a lot more root system out there. As far as the pH and everything on the, on the land, it's, it's been fairly decent for not having any lime on it, but we did go ahead and put out um, 1,500 pounds. So usually, usually someone, you know, they're putting out about a ton to the acre. And we are gonna put some chicken litter probably today or tomorrow on this pasture, just one ton to the acre. Kenny has obviously benefited from the weight gains in his animals, but what are the effects he sees in his own land as it rests up in the spring? Yeah, it has been positive because we're taking the grazing pressure off and letting some of my pastures rest a little bit. I'm able to move, when I bring the, the steers down here, I'm able to move my cow, cows and calves up there and eat some of those annuals that I've planted. And, it, and that rests my perennial pastures a little bit. And, it, and I've been able to feed a little less hay in those situations. All winter when I was having to feed hay, I had them on that sacrifice pasture. So when they're coming down here, I can kind of recoup that sacrifice area a little bit and get some annuals growing in there. So it gives me a little little break there. This this past winter, I was probably, I was feeding about uh, three bales a week for 25 animals, yeah, so some of that neighborhood. But uh, yes, it's been, been positive. For row crop farmers who don't have the time to care for animals year-round, first prize is to partner up with a reliable livestock producer. Trust and civility are important, yes, but if you want the working relationship to last more than a season, you may want to go beyond a simple handshake agreement. Well, I think you have a, need to have a good relationship with each other and be able to work together uh, and be flexible. The uh, row crop farmer and his schedule it has to kind of mesh with yours. And, and it's a little bit of an issue with me because when my animals are down here grazing and the, and the grass is good, it's also good back at my place. And it, I'm just trying to think, how can we stagger that where we got good grazing here when I've got bad grazing at home? So if you could work something like that out, that would that would help. But uh, I haven't figured that out yet. But uh, but just you just need to be able to work with each other and, and kind of think outside the box and make things work. You have an agreement just, I think that's the main thing, and just have something so everybody understands, you know, what the required from both with both parts. And, and it's, it's good to have something down on paper because it's, I think it's worked out for both those. Kenny's had some good gains and uh, made a little bit of money off the, off the custom grazing. Uh, and Kenny has good cows. So and I think that's a big thing. It helps when you're working with a partner who, who's easy to work with and has good cattle it makes, makes your job a lot easier. Before I say goodbye to you, I wanted you to know that this is not a unique situation and that there's money to be made for the livestock owner and for the landowner. We'll put links in the video description to give you the best possible resources that we have today to tell you about how to make this happen. I hope you can learn from our successes but especially from our mistakes. I'm Buzz Clute, so long.